What is it that has to be on the table for a perfect breakfast? Oh yeah, it's the jaw, with the yellowish sticky and sweet stuff in it. The honey, of course. And in today's episode, we're going to take an extensive look at it under the microscope. So the use of honey by man can be traced back very far, approximately for about 8000 years. Even the ancient Egyptians used honey for sweetening food or for preventing infections by putting it on wounds. And it's the hard-working honeybees we have to thank for the liquid gold. Day in and day out, they fly from flower to flower, collecting the nectar in their honey stomachs, only to throw it all up again when they are back in their hives. Yes, you heard that correctly. Basically, honey consists of nectar, bee salvia and bee vomit. For the bees themselves, honey serves as food and they also feed the larvae with it. It is mainly sugar, but it also contains many other ingredients, such as vitamins, enzymes, but also pollen and sometimes beeswax residues. Especially raw honey is rich in these healthy ingredients because it has been less processed compared to the normal supermarket honey. Probably you have had a cup of tea with honey when you were sick. The reason why you should put honey in your tea is that honey has, in fact, antibacterial and antimicrobial properties. This means that it can kill potentially dangerous microorganisms and we will be able to observe this special ability very well under the microscope later on. But first, let's compare the processed supermarket honey with the raw, unprocessed honey. The honey you can see here comes directly from the supermarket and it was heated and filtered before it was bottled. And as you can see, there is not really much to observe other than the yellowish texture you would expect. For comparison, let's take a quick look at the raw honey. Well, this honey is also kind of boring to look at, but minimal differences are still noticeable, such as the small honeycomb wax pieces, which can be seen here. I am now preparing some slides with the two types of honey so that I can show you something that is a bit more interesting. First, we have a look at the processed supermarket honey. This grey white structure that we can see here is the sugar, or rather the sugar crystals in the honey. But except for those, you can't really spot anything else of interest here either. Maybe the raw honey has something more to offer? At first glance, the two types of honey look pretty much the same. The sugar crystals are also clearly visible here, but there are also trapped air bubbles and the small wax residues that we spotted earlier. But it seems that Something else is hiding in the raw honey. Everywhere we look, we eventually came across these small greenish yellow dots. Any idea what these might be? I'll tell you. These dots are the pollen from flowers and I think we should take a closer look at those in the next step. For this, I dissolve the sugar crystals in the honey with a little bit of water so that we can spot the pollen more easily. Just now we can see how much pollen there is actually in the honey. I think it's a good idea if we take a closer look at a few of them and maybe we will be able to classify one or two of them to its genus. Let's start with this spiky friend here. Somehow it reminds me of something else. But never mind. 
I suspect that this pollen belongs to the genus Helianthus. They are also called sunflowers and, in my honey here, this spiky ball is the most common. By the way, it's these little pollens that bring some people to tears, as they are one of the most common triggers for seasonal allergies. Here is another roundish looking pollen, but in this case, the spikes are missing. However, the surface still does not look smooth, but kind of somewhat porous. After I did some extensive research, I believe that this pollen belongs to the genus Phagopyrum. More precisely, I think this pollen comes from the buckwheat plant. But please correct me if I'm wrong, because it is really difficult to accurately identify the pollen extracted from honey. And now to the next one. What does this pollen shape reminds you of? To me, it looks like a UFO from another galaxy. Unfortunately, it seems to be only a pollen from the genus Brassica. A well-known representative of this genus is Canola. And since it's May, it's also blooming right now, so my condolences to anyone allergic to it. Finally, let's look at this one here. Clearly, this is a snowflake, or at least its shape reminds me of one. The gear-like edge seems almost mechanical to me, and I strongly assume that this pollen belongs to the genus Taraxacum, commonly known as dandelions. But besides the sugar crystals, the different pollen shapes and the beeswax, there is not much else to observe, especially nothing that is somehow alive. I have already mentioned the antimicrobial properties of honey and in the next step I'll demonstrate them to you. Let's take another look at the non-diluted honey. There are several reasons why honey has antibacterial and antimicrobial effects. One of them is that honey is rather acidic. It has a relatively low pH between 3 and 4. For comparison, bottled water has a pH of 7 and our stomach acid has a pH of 1. In this acidic environment, most microorganisms are basically unable to multiply. Another reason for its microbial properties is right in front of us. It's the sugar crystals. Honey is a concentrated sugar solution. Ideally, its water content should not exceed 17%. Thus, honey has an osmotic effect, which means that it deprives pathogens of their vital water. But what exactly does osmotic effect mean? To illustrate the effect, I prepared a slide with the plant cells of a red onion. Did you notice that almost all vacuoles of these onion cells are completely filled with red cell sap? Healthy and normal onion cells should always look like this. In the next step, I will add some diluted honey to our cells. Immediately, you can observe on the red cell sap how the first vacuoles shrink in its size. Now, they barely fill the cell volume at all. This process is called osmosis, in which water can only move through the cell membrane from one direction. It occurs because of the difference in concentration of two liquids separated by a cell membrane. By adding the honey, we have disturbed this balance and now it sucks most of the water out of the cells. The cells dry out and ultimately so does the entire plant. It withers. Exactly the same happens with the pathogenic bacteria and microorganisms. The sugar in the honey deprives them of their water and this eventually leads to their death. 
Now that we have properly examined the honey together, I have a small personal request for you. If you like honey as much as I do, and you get the chance to buy it directly from beekeepers, then you should always go for that option. Beekeepers are doing everything they can to prevent the progression of bee mortality because they are fully aware that the extinction of bees would have devastating consequences for the entire ecosystem of our world. I hope you liked the video today and if you want to be on board for the next microscopic adventure, you can click the subscribe button now. But until then, don't forget to take your allergy meds.